Satoma Sadgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityurma Amritam Gamaya, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Om, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace. Peace. Good morning and namaste everybody. Everybody of course means there are exactly four people here in front of me. Uh, it's always a little strange to speak to uh, empty halls, but that's the new normal. We are live streaming, which means we have audiences across the United States and different time zones across the world in India. Here today it is the International Mother's Day. So I would like to greet you all on this occasion. In India, for thousands of years, God has been worshipped as mother, as the mother of the universe. Um, it's a little strange in um, in the West to think of God as mother because uh, in the Abrahamic religions God has always been thought of as male and as the father. But I'm reminded of a great Christian mystic. I think it was Meister Eckhart or one of the medieval mystics who said, what does God do all day long, I wonder? Well, the answer is God lies on this huge maternity bed and gives birth all day long, which means uh, God is the, uh, is the creator of the universe. But it's, it's, it's very appropriate when you think of God as the uh, mother of all of us. Today, I would like to speak about the big picture of Vedantic spirituality. Sometimes it's helpful to step back and consider what this entire project of spirituality is all about. What is the purpose of spirituality? What are we trying to do and how are we to do it? So Vedanta presents a wonderful map, as it were, of the spiritual journey. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to use uh, a text written by a great Advaitic master, Madhusudan Saraswati. And the reason I'm using this text is um, this year at, at, at a Harvard Divinity School, we were studying the Bhagavad Gita under the guidance of Professor Clooney. And the text we used was the Gurhartha Deepika, the lamp of profound knowledge or the lamp of hidden knowledge, uh, written by Madhusudan Saraswati, a great teacher of Advaita Vedanta. Now I found in that text at the beginning, Madhusudan Saraswati, before starting his extensive uh, commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, he gives an introduction. And in that introduction of 46 verses, of course all of this is in Sanskrit, in that introduction of 46 verses, he sketches an outline of the spiritual path. So, and I found that very interesting and very helpful. One of the unique features of Madhusudan Saraswati's writing is, he is as great a jnani as a bhakta. Devotion and knowledge and meditation and work are all beautifully interwoven into a wonderful spiritual synthesis in the writings of Madhusudan Saraswati. Um, I know that many people uh, are always worried about this, that we are basically devotional. And most of the teachings of Advaita Vedanta, are, they are centrally about knowledge in the path of jnana yoga. How do we reconcile the two? Uh, one scholar, P.M. Modi, um, many, many decades ago, uh, he said, in the time of Shankaracharya, the great issue was the conflict between the ritualistic action of the Purva Mimamsakas, like Kumarila Bhatta, and the total renunciation of action which is implied by non-dual knowledge. 
And so how do you reconcile the two, which takes precedence over the other and so on? So you find a lot of karma and jnana, no, action and knowledge, this kind of discussion and debate going on in Shankara's writings. By the time of Madhusudan Saraswati, more than 800 years after Shankaracharya, uh, the issue had shifted not so much karma and jnana, action and knowledge, uh, rather it was knowledge and devotion. How do you reconcile devotion to a personal God with the identity of which is implied by non-dual knowledge? I am Brahman versus I worship Brahman as, uh, as Vishnu or Narayana or as the Divine Mother. So this is the issue and this synthesis uh, beautifully knowledge and devotion is done by um, Madhusudan Saraswati. So before we go into this uh, description, um, let me give a little background about Madhusudan Saraswati, a very interesting story. So he was born at the end of the 15th century uh, in East Bengal, what is now Bangladesh. And he grew up um, in a traditional Brahmin family and learned the scriptures from his father who was a well-known scholar. Uh, when he was a young boy, he heard of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. By the way, Madhusudan Saraswati at the end of 15th century and uh, in 16th century where he lived, uh, he, he was a contemporary of two very famous people, well-known people in history. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who was uh, the leading figure of uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism, who spread the message of Krishna Bhakti uh, in Bengal and outside Bengal also and whose tradition is so strong, it lives on till today. In fact, in New York itself, the ISKCON is very well known, and that's a direct uh, descendant of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very much there. Uh, and also, uh, in the political sphere in Delhi, the emperor of India was Akbar. So the great Mughal emperor Akbar was there in Delhi. And... Uh, Madhusudan Saraswati, he was a little boy at that time, a young boy at that time, and he, was, he had heard of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he was very inspired uh, from his childhood. These two things you can see uh, together with him. Scholarship, a desire for knowledge, and devotion to Krishna. So he wanted to go to uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and become his disciple and learn Krishna Bhakti. So he, he travels all the way to Navadvipa, Unfortunately, at that time, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was not in Navadvipa. He had, he had gone out to spread the message of Krishna Bhakti um, in different parts of India. Madhusudan decided to stay back in, in uh, Navadvipa, wait for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to come back. And uh, in the meantime, he pursued his scholarly interests. Navadvipa at that time was the great center of Navya Nyaya, the neologic, the new developments in, in the Nyaya school, um, many scholars, not all of them Nyayakas, but scholars of different schools of, uh, of philosophy, they came to Navadvipa to learn the techniques of logic. And so Madhusudan stayed there, used his time to learn this and mastered it. And you can see it in his writings later on, this very subtle and precise kind of logic. While studying there, he and waiting for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. By the way, unfortunately, Madhusudan, to the best of our knowledge, never met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, he, he never really met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but he did meet Akbar, but more of, more of that later. While studying Navya Nyaya, Madhusudan Saraswati became aware of Advaita Vedanta and decided that this had to be refuted. And so his whole aim was this great Advaita, non dualist, in later in life. He started off his uh, study of Advaita Vedanta in order to refute it. So he decided that he would go and learn Advaita Vedanta in Banaras, which was the center, the great center of uh, Hindu learning in those days. Still is. Uh, he said he would go there and study Advaita Vedanta in order to refute it with the, his newly acquired knowledge of Nyaya, Navya Nyaya. He goes to Banaras, becomes a disciple of um, Ramatirtha a monk who was teaching Advaita Vedanta. And while studying Advaita Vedanta seriously, Madhusudan Saraswati was convinced about Advaita Vedanta. So from a dualist, he becomes a non-dualist. And uh, to the extent that he finally decided to become a monk uh, in the tradition of Shankaracharya. 
and he was initiated into monastic life by Vishveshwarananda Saraswati. So his name was his name became monastic name was Madhusudana Saraswati. Because he was a monk of the Advaita tradition and with his tremendous scholarship, he composed a number of very significant works. Among the scholars till today, his work, his most famous work is Advaita Siddhi. It's probably the single toughest book of Advaita Vedanta or at least one of a handful of very tough dialectical works. So what does he do in that? The, there were attacks on Advaita Vedanta by the dualistic schools of Vedanta. Especially Ramanuja Acharya of uh, Vishishta Advaita Vedanta who mounted a fierce attack uh, on Advaita Vedanta in, his, uh, in Ramanuja Acharya's his own commentary on the Brahma Sutras in the Sri Bhashyam where he calls Advaita Vedanta the Mahapurva Paksha, the great opponent and levels the seven great untenables, Saptavida Anupapatti, why the Advaita Vedanta philosophy is vitiated by logical inconsistencies in the, uh, in the concept of Maya. And then came the great dualistic uh, Acharya, Madhvacharya, who launched a fierce attack of, uh, on Advaita of his own um, and his followers, Vyasati and others, they also wrote very, uh, very penetrating dialectical works criticizing Advaita Vedanta. So Advaita was under uh, assault by the dualistic schools. Madhusudan Saraswati mounted a very able defense using his vast knowledge of Navyanaya, the techniques of logic. Uh, he countered the attacks of the dualists in his monumental work, Advaita Siddhi. But it's something very exclusively for scholars. For the masses uh, and for the scholars, Madhusudan Saraswati's beautiful work on the Bhagavad Gita, the Gurhartha Deepika, which is, which is, you can see, it's a pretty heavy text. Um, he says that I will comment, I will explain every word, almost every word of the Bhagavad Gita, and pretty much proceeds to do so. Um, so this Gurhartha Deepika, and apart from this, another book is the Siddhanta Bindu, which is Madhusudan Saraswati's uh, a pretty deep and profound commentary on Shankaracharya's Dasha Shloki. Shankaracharya wrote this simple poetical, um, uh, this work in, in verse, 10 verses to explain Advaita Vedanta. And the profound meaning of that has been expanded in this uh, book called Siddhanta Bindu. Bindu means a drop, but the drop itself is so profound. Uh, then another book of Madhusudan Saraswati is uh, Vedanta Kalpalatika, and it's also a dialectical work. In this Gurartha Deepika, which we shall see, uh, Madhusudan Saraswati's introduction is what we are going to see. Another interesting story about Madhusudan Saraswati is that uh, it seems that he is at the source of the Naga Sannyasis, so the fierce, uh, naked monks. Uh, the story is when he was in Banaras, the uh, Muslims. Uh, there in Banaras would attack the Hindu pilgrims and the Hindu priests and murder them. And uh, there was this law that, that uh, prevented any prosecution of any religious group. So they, they were not punished. Now the Hindus were helpless and they appealed to Madhusudan Saraswati who was staying there already well known. And Madhusudan Saraswati uh, went and met um, Akbar through Birbal. So Birbal is a very f famous and ve beloved character in India. So through Be Birbal, Madhusudan Saraswati met Akbar and explained the plight of the Hindus in Banaras. And Emperor Akbar said, I cannot directly punish those responsible uh, because of the law. But what you can do is, you also raise a group of uh, people, of Hindus, who will protect the other Hindus by fighting back against the Muslims who attacked them and they will also not be prosecuted under the same law. And so Madhusudan Saraswati went back and this is how the Naga Sanyasis, Kshatriyas, people of the Hindus of the warrior caste who became monks and stayed in Akharas. Akharas are literally gymnasiums or wrestling schools but they are now known as uh, monasteries. So and they became monks and they fought back and protected the uh, Hindu priests and pilgrims. So this is a very interesting story. Madhusudan Saraswati lived for a long time. 
he, um, for many years, he passed away in Haridwar at the age of well over a hundred years. But this text, in this text, Madhusudan Saraswati, he makes interesting observations about the Bhagavad Gita before explanation, before the commentary. He says, um, what is the Bhagavad Gita? Just as the Veda has three parts, has three khandas, karma kanda, the ritualistic part, and the upasana kanda, and the jnana kanda. Upasana kanda um, is, uh, the word upasana has two meanings. It's usually translated as either worship or meditation. Not, neither of them are exactly right. Vedic upasana is something a little different from the upasana, the worship, which we do as modern Hindus, the puja that we do. So it's a, it's a ritualistic worship of a deity. Vedic Upasana was more like a contemplative exercise um, involving the Vedic gods and nature and the human self. Meditation also is not quite the right translation of uh, Vedic Upasana because it's not like yogic meditation or it's not like Buddhistic Vipassana, um, not like our modern mindfulness. Uh, rather, it's, it's this, as I said, a contemplative exercise in which the cosmic, the individual and the divine are all bought on, on one plane. And it prepares the mind for uh, the next part of the Vedas, which is the Jnana Kanta, the Upanishads. We are familiar with that. This Vedanta, what we study here, is this third and final part of the Vedas, the Jnana Kanta, the, the part dealing with knowledge. Similarly, Madhusudan Saraswati says, the Bhagavad Gita also has three parts. We know that the Bhagavad Gita has 18 chapters. So Madhusudan Saraswati divides them into three parts of six chapters each. And he says the first six chapters deal with action. Not in the sense of Vedic action, but more in the sense of uh, Arjuna's question, uh, whether I should fight this war. So what about our daily duties? Um, are they to be abandoned if you want spirituality or can they be combined with spirituality? Can they be spiritualized? So these questions of action are taken up in the first part, first six chapters. Remember, this is Madhusudan Saraswati's take on the Gita, his reading of the Gita. The second six, uh, from chapter 7 onwards to chapter 12, is Upasana, uh, worship. Here it's, it's worship of God. In the Bhagavad Gita, it's worship of God. And then the third part of the Bhagavad Gita, he says, final part is jnana, knowledge. Knowledge of Brahman, that I am Brahman. He says, so, so the, according to Madhusudan Saraswati, the Gita has three main themes. Action, karma, um, devotion, bhakti, and knowledge, jnana. Another interesting observation that Madhusudan Saraswati makes on the Bhagavad Gita is... That the Gita can be understood as this whole message of Gita can be understood as Tattvamasi, that thou art. The famous Mahavakya, the great saying of Advaita Vedanta, which comes from the Chandogya Upanishad, that thou art, that meaning Brahman, thou meaning you, the Jiva, the sentient being, you are Brahman. The same meaning as Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. I am Atma Brahma, this very self is Brahman. Prajnanam Brahma. This very awareness within us is the ultimate reality. So, according to Madhusudan Saraswati, the whole Gita can be understood by Tattva Masi, that thou art. The first three chapters, first six chapters, uh, he divides it into three again. The first six chapters, chapters one to six, are about thou, the individual being. The next six chapters, from seven to twelve, are about God, Saguna Brahman. Tat. And the last six chapters from 13 to 18 are about the oneness of, of that and thou. How can this individual sentient being and, the and God, the Lord of the universe, in what sense are they one and the same? Um, so that's the, uh, th the last six chapters. It's not an entirely new way of looking at the Bhagavad Gita. For example, there was a great scholar saint, um, Anandagiri. Shankaracharya wrote commentaries on the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita and uh, the Brahma Sutras. 
and on all of these commentaries anandagiri has written a com- sub commentary so commentary and sub commentary it's a vast body of work and so he has written a commentary on the bhagavad gita also and there anandagiri who lived quite some time before um madhusudan saraswati anandagiri wrote that the bhagavad gita has three parts one he says uh, uh, um karma khanda um brahma khanda or jiva khanda brahma khanda aikya khanda so jiva khanda is the the first six chapters about the sentient being us this brahma khanda is the second six chapters about god and the last one aikya means identity identity of the individual and the cosmic of of jiva and brahma so anyway the same kind of idea which madhusudan saraswati took up and so he says this whole thing is meant bhagavad gita is meant to give you the knowledge that you are brahman and thus set you free from samsara and um uh, you attain moksha moksha is liberation and to be understood as freedom from the cycle of birth and death freedom from sorrow and suffering attainment of ultimate bliss atyantika dukkha nivritti paramananda prapti that's the goal now madhusudan saraswati says let us look at the steps of the spiritual path so that's our subject for today what is the spiritual journey uh, what happens in spiritual life according to uh, madhusudan saraswati so the i'm just reading out a few verses the 12th verse on the introduction written by madhusudan saraswati introduction to his commentary on the bhagavad gita निष्काम्य निषिधर्मो जपस्तुदेशन ऑफ एनी स्पिरिचुअलिटी इज धर्म मधुसूदन सरस्वती से इज फर्स्ट इज निष्काम कर्म सेल्फलेस एक्शन giving up nishiddha kamya giving up action which is prohibited that is immoral action an action which is born of desire giving them up performing selfless action and there also the repeated repetition of the name of hari of krishna is the best kind of action you see dharma morals ethical life is the foundation of spirituality if it's not that anybody who is uh, a good person is automatically spiritual may not be but a spiritual person a truly spiritual person also has to be necessarily a good person one cannot jump from adharma to adhyatma adharma means immoral life unethical life adhyatma means spiritual life one cannot make that jump it always has to go through dharma the under- understanding in hinduism is that dharma is at the source of all material sp- uh, prosperity and spiritual success also so from dharma comes artha and kama and uh, uh, that is on a moral and ethical basis one may pursue the um, attaining pleasure in life attaining success in life and if one wants the ultimate realization freedom spirituality then one gives up the pursuit of uh no longer is money or pleasure the goal of life then god realization enlightenment becomes the goal of life moksha so moksha becomes the goal but there also the basis is dharma one might you might call it sakama dharma nishkama dharma dharma with desires dharma without any kind of worldly desire this is what madhusudan saraswati points out at the beginning one cannot jump from an immoral unethical life to spiritual life it has to go through moral life or ethical life why one might just ask why is that so um why can't a person be uh, immoral tell lies and be selfish and violent and be spiritual also the reason is so i'm vivekananda would say the simple reason is remember it is the same mind we have only one mind that mind which if it is um uh, immoral that same mind you want to make it spiritual it will not work why not there is a direct contradiction the contradiction is this immoral uh, immoral life unethical life 
telling lies, um, you know, being violent to others, um, unrestrained sensuality, um, unsel uh, a selfish activity all the time, um, all kinds of immoral activities. Remember, they all are indicative of lack of control of the mind. Nobody tells a, li a, a lie, nobody hurts somebody else, nobody steals or murders out of unselfishness, out of the goodness of heart, uh, out of a desire for enlightenment. No, it's just the opposite. We, we become unethical, we do immoral things because of either temptation or fear. Terror or temptation. Either we are afraid of something, then we tell a lie to escape trouble and we get into deeper trouble. And or we are so tempted and we cannot resist that temptation, uh, we overstep the bounds of morals or ethics. Now that mind which cannot control, uh, which cannot restrain itself under the impulse of temptation or fear, that mind, how will it be restrained in meditation? How will it, it will come out of worldliness and focus on God? How will it expand that which cannot hold on to truth in day-to-day -day life, telling lies casually? Uh, how can that mind uh, grasp the ultimate truth? So it's for not for nothing that Brahman is known as Sat, pure being. Sat and Satya. Satya means truth. The, the truth that we have in our transactional life. Telling the truth. Meaning what one says. The two are not unrelated. So our commonplace morals our day-to-day -day ethics have a foundation in the ultimate reality. If we violate it at this level, we'll it will be impossible to grasp that, uh, that reality as, as sat, as pure being. So the basis is dharma. Yeah. Without that, no control of mind is possible. Without that, spirituality is po not possible. Bhakti is not possible. Meditation is not possible. I'm reminded of the... Um, the Funny story of the man who went to learn yoga, meditation. Patanjali's yoga. Uh, Ashtanga yoga, the eight-limbed yoga. And uh, the master, meditation master said, the first two limbs, yama and niyama, morals, ethics, do's and don'ts. Tell the truth. Practice non-violence. And this man, uh, he said, yeah, yeah, I know all that. We have been taught all that in primary school. Uh, you know, everybody is told, be a good boy, tell the truth. Uh, but I want to learn meditation, breathing and asana, uh, how to sit, how to breathe and how to concentrate. Asana sikhaye, pranayam sikhaye, dhyan sikhaye, please teach me meditation, please teach me breathing techniques, please teach me how to sit. Those are the higher limbs, the further limbs of the eight-limbed yoga. Now the meditation master, he smiled and he said, so this works very nicely in Hindi. He said, do you want to learn the eight-limbed yoga or the handicapped yoga? Which means without two limbs, the first two limbs. In Hindi it is, Ashtang yoga sikhenge ya vikalang yoga sikhenge? Will you <laughs> learn yoga with all the eight limbs or if you leave out the first two limbs? Without morals, spirituality is not possible. Um, the master said to that man who was probably a rich man, he said, Aap, in Hindi, Aap black money par asan bichaoge dhyan hoga. You have undeclared income which you have not declared to the tax man and you hide it under your meditation mat and sit on top of that and try to con concentrate. Is it possible? Will the mind be concentrated? Uh, impossible. A guilty mind cannot be focused. In the Indic traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, the, the underlying logic of, uh, of ethics was based on the law of karma. Very simply, do good, the result is good. And do bad, the result is bad. Good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law, Swami Vivekananda said. So in uh, Sanskrit, doing good, dharma, generates a, a merit called punya. And that punya, that merit, ultimately gives rise to happiness. Good things, pleasant things, things go your way. What, what you, would, uh, you get a good life. Punya give, gives sukha. Dharma, punya, sukha. And the opposite. If one consciously does what, is, what one knows to be wrong, adharma, 
that gives rise to a demerit called papa or sin and that demerit or that sin gives rise to misery in life dukkha so adharma papa dukkha it could be in this life it could be in next life when things go your way when things are going nicely we generally don't question uh, why I, am i getting good things in life it's the opposite it's usually when things go badly we say why is this happening to me discounting all the good things that happened to us but when good things go your way things are nice with you and your family your job your health the environment around you uh, then you say then it, the law of karma says this is the result of your punya in past lives the accumulated merit gives rise to these sukhas these happiness when things things do not go uh, uh, the way we want them to um, there is unhappiness and misery and uh, and uh, covid 19 uh, and so the law of karma says it is because of our accumulated demerit pap of past lives and this is something that is deeply um axiomatically held in india it's sort of in the atmosphere there people it's an instinctive understanding people say why is this happening to me i must have done so what did i do wrong that means i must have done something wrong that's why something wrong is something bad is happening to me so it's some sort of instinctive feeling and it's there in some other forms also um say in the um abrahamic religions for example uh, what you sow so shall you reap uh, this is basically the law of karma it's put in the language of reward or punishment by god but it's basically the same thing if when you say god is just which means the evil doers are punished and those who are good they are rewarded it's basically the law of karma now our modern mindset is why should i believe in that why should i believe in that where is the connection whether there was any past life at all or not and if i do something good now where is the connection where is the surety that i i will get some reward for this where is the connection between bad things happening now and um, bad things done by me good things happening now and good things done by me where is the connection we will not believe in the law of karma one sadhu said it's from a village in north india he said in my father's time we would see simple villagers saying that you no know, has been pressurized to say false things in court he said i cannot say false things in court i cannot bear false witness because i have children i have a family which means the law of karma if i do something evil something bad will happen to me so i can't say uh, i can't tell lies uh, even if you bribe me even if you give me money i can't tell lies will be in serious trouble and he said now in the same village the same uh, person says that i have to tell uh, lies because i have a family uh, because then i will get some money from it so the belief in the law of karma is gone and now it is just this world and this this uh, and, and money here and my family here and uh, somehow or the other to by even by illegal means even by taking bribes to provide for my family or or for myself so see how morals and ethics are given up when the basic belief in the law of karma is given now somebody might say i don't need a god to make me good i remember in front of a church there was a notice like a, like a board good minus god so g o o d minus g o d so that remain what is remaining is only one o one zero so good minus god if you take god out of morals or ethics nothing is remaining but somebody might oppose that i don't believe in god i don't believe in your law of karma but i will be good why because it is my nature to be good it is human dignity i'll be good because it is good to be good very good if one can think like that and i behave like that and that it's a very evolved mentality but what has happened in our world today is we have not changed much our technology has changed our science has changed our uh, our society has evolved but humanity our basic morals have not evolved so much over the thousands of years and when we give up belief in god and in religion and in in, in karma and the law of karma what practically happens is not that i will be good because it is my nature to be good that is big talk in practice you will find 
a lot of immorality, a lot of unethical activity going on. Uh, so this has happened to some extent. That is what Madhusudan Saraswati is saying. First, moral action. This also is of two types. One is Sakama Dharma. Yes, you may pursue, first give up unethical action, immoral action. Don't steal, don't tell lies, don't murder. The, the commandments in Judaism, for example, Ten Commandments, most of them are about fundamentals of ethics. <coughs> but one may still pursue selfish ends in life uh, within the limits of morals, within the limits of legality, within the limits of decency. Kamya karma. Kamya karma means action with desire. So for I want to be rich, I want to be famous, I want to be happy. All that within the limits of morals, it can be done. And most people do it. If, if it were not so, society would fall apart. But one must take the next step in spiritual life. He says, Tyagat, by giving up, Kamya Nishiddhayo. Immoral action, of course one must give up. But moral action with selfishness, that also one must give up. So action is to, is to continue, but it becomes karma yoga. Arjuna's example. Arjuna had come to the battlefield to fight against the evildoers, the Kauravas, and fight for what was rightfully his and his, his brothers, the kingdom. So his action was moral. It was the duty of a Kshatriya. But still selfish, it was for himself. Now when Arjuna says, I have no interest in the kingdom, Krishna will teach him karma yoga. You, <coughs> you do not have any selfish desire anymore, but the action can now continue. Can, you must continue to do your duty without selfish desires. And that will be the preparation for higher spiritual life. So, three divisions. Karma for immoral reasons. Nishiddha karma. So, like the Kauravas, the evildoers in the battle, who were there for selfish reasons and immoral reasons. Karma for moral but selfish reasons. Kamya karma. Which Arjuna had come initially and then he refused to do that anymore. And then karma is nishkama karma, third one, which is called karma yoga. To do one's duty, to do what is good uh, as a duty, as a preparation for higher spiritual life. Basically, the term is karma yoga. That's what he says, um, Madhusudan, that is the foundation of spiritual life. There also, what's the best kind of karma? Here is the uniqueness of Madhusudan Saraswati. Up to this is standard Advaita Vedanta. But, Madhusudan Saraswati says, Tatrapi paramo dharmo japas tutyadikam hare. Praising Lord Hari, praising Krishna and repeating the name of Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. This japa, that's the best kind of action. In all the action that you can do, the best kind of action is repeating the name of the Lord. Especially those of us who are initiated, who have got mantra diksha. We should take heed of this. The best action is repeating the mantra, the name of the Lord. You see, this is the uniqueness of Madhusudan Saraswati. How he integrates bhakti into traditional, the Advaitic structure. Then what comes next? By doing this, what will happen? Shina papasya chittasya viveke yogyata yada nitya nitya vivekastu jayate sudridhastata. Karma yoga purifies the mind. Why? The source of impurity is trying to do things in the world to satisfy this person, this body and mind. And everything associated with this body and mind. My family, my business, my property. And so this selfishness is at the root of um, impurity. And karma yoga cuts directly at this selfishness. It's a lifestyle where you live for the welfare of others, minimizing one's own needs to the very basic minimum. And then activity goes on. We do not abandon activity, but it's for the welfare of the world. It reverses the selfish tendency in action. Kshina papasya, which means the impurities of the mind. 
Shina papasya chittasya. Impurities of the mind are cleansed. Then what happens? Viveke yogyata yada. Nitya nitya vivekastu jayate sudridastada. It gives you qualification for Vedanta. The first qualification for Vedanta is Viveka. Viveka means discernment. Discernment between what is eternal and non-eternal. The moment selfishness is reduced, we begin to see clearly that just about everything that we were pursuing selfishly to make this body happy, neither those things are eternal, Neither that food or drink or persons or pleasures are eternal. None of them are eternal. They will all go away. Nor is this body. What a foolish endeavor. This body will also age. Every moment it is aging and decaying. This body will also go away. This whole enterprise is a fool's enterprise. Action is not a fool's enterprise. Action for the welfare of others. Action in performance of duty. Action in, as he says, repetition of the names uh, names of the Lord. This is This is... Uh, absolutely central to spirituality but action to spending one's valuable human life trying to satisfy and please an ever decaying dying body uh, the please satisfy the momentary impulses of the mind that's a fool's enterprise one realizes nitya anitya vastu viveka discernment between all that is ephemeral transient non-eternal passing Born now, dying next day. Um, created and destroyed. When one becomes unselfish, that propensity to chase these things disappears. And then we have read about Vedanta. We have read some kind of religious, spiritual instruction is there. There is an eternal reality. There is a place of undiluted joy or peace. There is a state in which we can rise above all the ups and downs of life and remain in peace. Brahman, you have read about it. It's not that it's already accomplished. You know Brahman is eternal, world is non-eternal. We have realized it. If you have realized it, that's the end of the path. But the beginning is, we know about it and we, we think that it is worth pursuing. Many people, read, many people do not know about it. Many people read about it but are not persuaded. Why not? Because the selfish instinct is very strong. When that is diluted, when moral life becomes firm, steady, then one takes it seriously that an eternal reality is there. I believe it. It's worth pursuing. Swami Abhedanandaji was here in the Vedanta Society of New York more than a hundred years ago. So when he was he used to travel extensively in the United States, when he was giving a talk in one place, this one young person asked, Is this true? What you are teaching? That there is such a reality as Brahman and we can realize it. He said, Yes. Then what else matters? If this is true, what else matters? We must pursue this. If this is not true, what else matters? And that person, uh, I think it was a young lady, and she disappeared. She did not come from, uh, to the class anymore and she devoted the rest of her life to meditation and spiritual practice to realize this. So, so you see, this clarity comes. Nitya nitya vastu viveka. Then what happens? Vairagya, dispassion comes. The next verse, Madhusudan Saraswati says, Iha mutrartha vairagyam vashikarana bhidham kramat tata shamadi sampatya sanyaso nishthito bhavet. Um, dispassion for all that is non eternal, here and hereafter. Iha amutra. Iha means in this world pleasures and uh, uh, acquisition of, of wealth and property and uh, pursuing temporal goals in this world for the sake of happiness here. One gets a dispassion towards that, that I have seen enough of that, that there is no, no eternal permanent happiness there. And the promise of heaven, that after uh, this life also, there will be a heaven in which Eternal party will be there. You will be uh, happy, happiness without in, in being diluted by uh, any unhappiness. Some kind of uh, pleasures will go on in heaven. That also comes to an end. As your punya, merit is exhausted, 
the heavenly sojourn is interrupted and you come back to this world again that also comes to an end not worth pursu- pursuing a uh, dispassion comes and here madhusudan saraswati has uh, given uh, uh, he says vashikar abhidam kramat the interesting term it is it is from the patanjali yoga sutras where vairagya or dispassion they have analyzed this and there are four stages of it so four stages of vairagya the, the uh, highest stage is called vashikar so very quickly what are they all about vashikar sangya that means in patanjali yoga sutras it is said um drishta anushravika vishaya vitrishnasya vashikar sangya vairagyam this is the sutra a dispassion for drishta means seen whatever you see or hear about in this world whatever is available here a dispassion for that that i have seen through it i don't want it it's not my goal in life and anushravika what we hear about in the scripture especially there is a beautiful place called heaven and perform such and such rituals uh, acquire enough merit punya after death you shall go to heaven very attractive or at least it was very attractive to our forefathers i remember when we were brahmacharis uh, novices studying uh, at the training center in belur math our main monastery in india swami smarananand ji maharaj who is now the most revered president of our order um he used to teach us and in one class he mentioned that um, uh, about heaven so you, sh- you should have dispassion about going to heaven and we he says how easily we modern people we say yes yes i don't want heaven i'm not going to this these um, heavens to enjoy pleasures the lower heavens we easily dismiss that because we don't believe in it anymore he joked and he said you don't have the dispassion to give up one rasgulla and you're going to give up heaven one sweet you don't have the dispassion to give up and yet you say that i will give up uh, the heavenly pleasures no you just don't believe in it that's why you say that but remember these ancients at least they believed very strongly such a thing is there um and so giving up those pleasures also because they are non eternal that gives that is the second qualification vairagya and then he says tata samadhi sampatya then the sixth comes the six fold treasure or the six fold resources you need for spiritual journey what are the six uh, basically six mental disciplines shama calmness of mind a steadiness of mind not impulsive not distracted easily damaha a control of the sense organs and motor organs again to enable you to focus on vedanta titiksha a spiritual toughness fortitude come what may in life i shall pursue with my pursue my spiritual practices see for your job for getting a degree from a university uh, we put up with so much trouble physical illness and opposition from others financial problems we put up with all of that to achieve our goals so at least that much effort and dedication should be there in in vedanta so titiksha without any complaint putting up with the troubles thrown at us by the world and pursuing your spiritual path then um sham shama dama titiksha uparati this constant engagement with the world taking pleasure in the things outside work hard throughout the week so it's a new york ethic Uh, manhattan not so much now thanks to the pandemic but otherwise work out throughout the week monday to friday day and night um, you know wall street and then saturday and sunday go out drinking having fun and spend the time just relaxing unwinding so that you're ready for one more week in monday so no uh, withdrawal from too much engagement uh, in pleasure seeking activities in the world uparati and having withdrawn use that time energy and mental bandwidth samadhana focus focus on vedanta stay there focus samadhana and then comes shraddha so shraddha 
means um, Guru and Shastra Vakya, what the teacher has told us and what we study in these texts, a belief, this must be true, even though I don't get it right now, even though I have not realized it, this must be true because they have told us, have that kind of working faith, without which any progress is impossible. So these are the six mental disciplines called the six treasures, Sampatti, Shat Sampatti, Shama, Dhamma, Uparat, um, Titiksha, Uparati, Samadhana and Shraddha. And finally comes, out of all of this comes Mumuksha, an intense desire to be free. And as this is all foundational for Vedanta. Next verse he says, Evam sarva parityagat mumuksha jayate dridha tato guru upasadanam upadesha grahastataha. In this way, by giving up everything, by giving up everything in the earlier verse, Madhusudan Saraswati had mentioned sannyasa. Remember, one thing one must remember, context is important. Madhusudan Saraswati was a monk. And most of his audience was most probably, he was speaking to monks. So, all of these practices is culminates in monkhood and sannyasa. Is this absolutely essential? Yes and no. No in the sense that everybody doesn't have to become a, formally become a monk, nor is it possible for everybody to become a monk. But, yes, in the sense that everybody has to become in some sense monk-like. It must be a pursuit of enlightenment, pursuit of God-realization. All other things must be secondary to that. So that's what, in a general sense, he means. Sarva Parityagat means, giving up everything means, giving up the pursuit of acquisition, artha, pleasure, karma, giving up that those are the goals of my life, giving up that, and making moksha, enlightenment, the goal of one's life. Obviously, everybody does not become a formally become a monk because remember, this is Bhagavad Gita. Krishna is not formally a sannyasi, who is the teacher. Arjuna is not at all formally a sannyasi, who is the student. And it is being taught by Krishna to Arjuna. Mumuksha jayate, a strong desire to be enlightened arises. Mumuksha jayate tada. Mumuksha means. The desire for liberation, for moksha. It comes from what? It comes from viveka, vairagya and the six treasures, and the, the six disciplines. When they are practiced, so there is a causal link. The intense desire for liberation comes from a proper cultivation of those six disciplines. The proper cultivation of those six disciplines depends upon dispassion, vairagya. And this uh, vairagya depends upon viveka, the discernment. So there is a causal link. Viveka leads to vairagya, vairagya leads to the sixfold disciplines, and the sixfold disciplines or treasures, they lead to the intensification of the desire for enlightenment or, or liberation. All of us who are interested in spiritual life, we have these to some extent, but not enough. So these ones have to be intensified and the way to intensify it is an important secret. The way to intensify it, if you want intense de desire for liberation, look at, instead of trying to say how can I have desire for liberation, you cannot directly boost a desire. Desire is either there or not there. What you can do is in intensify the practice of those six disciplines. These five, the six disciplines are shaky, mind is disturbed, um, dispassion is not there. Fortitude is not there. What happened? What's the problem? Vairagya. Go back to the earlier stage. Dispassion for worldly goals. Is that strong? No, desires are there. Then go back to the earlier stage. Viveka. Viveka is um, this uh, discernment between eternal and non-eternal. Have you strengthened that? Then the others will come. I think I missed out one. He says, Vairagya, he has used this word from Patanjali Yoga Sutras, Vashikara Sangya, that means dispassion has also got stages. This is something that he is importing from Patanjali Yoga Sutras. There are different stages. One is, the highest is Vashikara, which he mentioned here, complete dispassion for what is here and what is hereafter. But before that, there are three earlier stages. 
The first stage is called yatamana, where yatamana means effortful. And we can all relate to these things. Yatamana means effortful. What is its nature? I must learn what is essential in life and what is not essential in life. What is saram, what is asaram in life. I must learn from the teacher and from the texts and practice that. That's the beginning of Vairagya. And we all feel like that. And then the next one is called Vyatireka, exclusion. Exclusion means, by this time I know there's a lot of things which I've given up successfully. I'm not interested in those things. But a few remain. I'm aware of it. One must admit it to oneself. These are my weaknesses at present. And I will work upon it. That's the second stage, Vyatireka Vairagya. Third stage is, the thorough house cleansing has been done. In the mind, a cleansing has been done. And there is no obvious outward worldly tendency. But still in the mind, there is a longing. Externally, there is the life is very pure and simple. But some seed of longing still remains. That stage is called Ekendriya. All the desires are now withdrawn into the mind. But the potential is still there. And finally, fourth stage, Vashikara, which um, Madhusudan Saraswati mentions where um, there is a complete dispassion for what is here and what is hereafter. With these qualifications, one goes to the teacher, Guru Pasadaram, and then gets instruction in Vedanta. What is the instruction like? Let me read it out. Tata Sandeha Naya Vedanta Shravanadikam Sarvam Uttarami Mamsa Shastram Matrupa Yujyate. So there after thereafter there is the study of Vedanta. Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. A systematic study, hearing literally hearing the teachings, but systematically studying it, and there's a system for that. And then manana, cogitating upon it, reflecting upon it, arguing about it, uh, clarifying doubts about it. And nididhyasana, meditating on the, the teachings which have now been clarified. So this starts now. And he says, Sarva Uttaram Imamsa Shastram. Uttaram Imamsa is Vedanta, the Upanishads. The entirety of the Upanishadic teachings, the Bhagavad Gita also, and the Brahma Sutra, they are all meant for this stage. So this is the stage at which it becomes effective. One might think that's a tall order. I don't have those qualifications. We all have it to some extent. And to that extent, Vedanta is useful. A Vedanta master once told me, uh, he said, with these qualifications, if one studies Vedanta, one will get enlightenment. Without sufficient qualification, these four qualifications which I talked about, Without sufficient qualification, without sufficient degree of these qualifications, if one studies Vedanta, one will end up with the feeling, I learnt a very nice philosophy. But so what? My life has not changed yet. Same Vedanta teaching. The mind is prepared by these qualifications. I remember when I was in the uh, training centre in Belur Mat, where, where novices are trained, and I was a teacher there for about eight years. So it's a two-year programme. And I sometimes had this interesting experience when I taught the novices in the first year. And the same novices, when they came to the second year, sometimes they would say, Swami, your teaching, Maharaj, your teaching has improved. It's getting better. I, was, I would smile. It's the same thing that I've been teaching for eight years. It's not that my teaching has changed. It's just that going through that program, intensively studying this and living that life, one's mind becomes ready, uh, uh, prepared to absorb those truths better. And now you find it very interesting, very practical, very effective. And you think, oh, he's teaching better now. <laughs> Sarvam Uttara Mimamsa Shastram, the entirety of Vedantic uh, scriptures, the teachings, they become relevant now. This is what is, is to be taught here at this stage. Then what happens? Tatas tatparipa kena nididhyasana nishthata yoga shastram tu sampurnam upakshinam bhavediha. Then comes a deep, a stage of deep meditation on the teachings. The teachings which we have heard, which we have now clarified and understood, stay with it. This is called nididhyasanam. And here, 
the teachings of patanjali yoga sutra they become relevant see how madhusudan saraswati is beautifully integrating the yoga shastra patanjali's yoga the bhakti shastra uh, uh, and uh, the vedanta integrating them into a synthesis of spirituality action karma meditation yoga devotion bhakti and knowledge gyana they are all synthesized Uh, into an integral spirituality in sanatana dharma this has always been so all the paths all the techniques are useful acharyas have always used all of them depending upon the particular darshana philosophical approach one is put hierarchically above the others so shankara puts gyana at the top but also karma yoga bhakti all are useful Ramanuja puts bhakti at the top but even in in Ramanuja siddhanta karma and uh, yoga and gyana they are all useful so all of these elements form the part of uh, the spiritual path and our individual life also should have these four elements of devotion of uh, of work of meditation and of knowledge then he says क्षीणदोषे तत्ते वाक्य वाक्यतमतीर्भवे साक्षात्कारो निर्विकल्प शब्दादेवजाते एज द माइंड बिकम सेटल्ड इन द रियलाइजेशन आई एम ब्रह्म इन द नॉलेज ऑफ आई एम ब्रह्मन वाक्यतमतीर्भवे enlightenment comes to put it very simply vakya tattva means vakya means sentence what sentence you are that tattva masi what sentence aham brahmasmi i am brahman this flashes in a moment intuitive the technical word is brahmakara vritti an intuitive grasp of of one's nature as brahman and that comes in the mind itself in the intellect itself in a flash but that flash is preceded by so much of preparation and that flash of intuition sakshatkaro nirvikalpa intuitive flash flash it's not thinking about it anymore you realize it you see it as clearly see of course within quotes it is a very clear realization and here there is an important um, technical point here shabdad eva upajayate and this realization what does it come from meditation no madhusudan saraswati makes this important point here realization enlightenment comes from the shabda means the upanishadic text which the guru has taught you has told you you are brahman and that gives rise to enlightenment normally we think that oh we hear that then we reason about it and meditate and then become enlightened so meditation must be the cause of enlightenment now there are two views in uh, uh, vedanta about this in advaita vedanta one is the view of um, is it on one is uh, the view of padmapada acharya the um, disciple of shankara acharya other one is the view of vachaspati mishra who is the writer of a wonderful commentary on shankara's commentary on the brahma sutras uh, vachaspati mishra wrote this bhamati so there are two sub schools of advaita vedanta one is the school of padma pada acharya which came to be known as the vivarana school and the other one is the school of uh, which comes from the bhamati interpretation given by vachaspati mishra which came to be known as the bhamati school there are number of differences between the two approaches but one difference is here where does enlightenment come from does enlightenment come from the vedic vedantic statement that thou art aham brahmasmi or does it come from meditation on those statements vachat vachaspati mishra says it comes from meditation first shravana hearing second uh, manana reasoning third nididhyasana meditation and then from that comes the intuitive flash brahmakara vritti you realize that you are brahman padma pada acharya said no i mean i said said but he actually precedes vachaspati mishra he said that knowledge actually comes from the 
text. And there's a technical reason for this. Knowledge comes from pramana. Pramana means source of knowledge. So eyes are the pramana for what we see. Ears are the pramana for the sound that we hear. Similarly, um, for the realization that I am Brahman, Upanishads are the pramana. So pramana gives rise to knowledge, prama, knowledge. Source of knowledge gives rise to knowledge. Meditation according to Vedanta is not a source of knowledge. Upanishad is the source of knowledge. So Upanishad gives rise, the words gives rise to direct knowledge. How? The example I have always, uh, I often give of uh, the ten men who crossed the river and then they thought one of them was drowned. They were counting only themselves. They found only nine people. And uh, somebody came and told them, thou art the tenth. And then he realized, oh, I am the tenth. Now, from the words of that wise person, thou art the tenth. Dashamas Tvamasi. Tvamasi Dashama. Those words gives rise to the direct knowledge, I am the tenth. The ignorance was broken by the words. So the words are the source of knowledge. Now, then what about reasoning? What about meditation? According to Padmapada's uh, interpretation, reasoning and meditation remove obstacles uh, to knowledge. Knowledge is given by this Guru's statement that thou art. That, is, that produces knowledge, but I can't understand it. Then reasoning about it removes my confusions. I cannot center myself in that. I, it's, the clarity is not there. Meditation gives me that clarity and removes the contrary tendencies. Uh, the tendency to behave as body and mind, that is removed by staying with that awareness, I am Brahman, Nididhyasana. So they, there are obstacles which are removed by reasoning and meditation. Manana and Nididhyasana. But after the obstacles have been removed, we realize knowledge has come from the Vedantic statement that thou art. So this is called Shabda Parokshavada. The, the view that the texts directly gave you the realization of Brahman. Aparokshanubhuti, direct realization of Brahman, it comes from the text itself. So, Shakshat Kara Shabda Deva Upajayate. From the Shabda, from the text itself, from the words itself, realization comes. So, now we know that Madhusudana follows the Padma, Padmapada school of interpretation, the Vivarana school of interpretation, and not the Vachaspati Mishra school of interpretation, the Bhamati school of interpretation. Then, one more verse. Avidya Vinivritti Stu. Tattva jnano dai bhavet, tata avarane kshine, kshiyate brahma samshayo. So this is enlightenment. Moment this realization flashes, I am Brahman. Tattva jnana udaya, it's like sunrise. I am Brahman, this realization comes and you see there is one reality in which the entire world appears. And you are that one reality. The world is not a reality. This body and mind is not a reality. You are the reality which is of the nature of existence, consciousness, and infinite bliss, and infinite fulfillment. And this entire world experience appears there, plays around, and disappears there. This clarity, it's right here. We don't see it. The moment you see it, ignorance is gone. That ignorance which hid it from us, Till now, that is gone. Tata avarane kshine. So ignorance or maya, avidya, let us say ignorance, in Vedanta has two functions. Avarana vikshepa. Avarana means it hides the reality. So it's a rope, but I don't see it as a rope. I see it as a snake. The ignorance about the rope, first of all, hides the rope as it were from me. The second thing it does is vikshepa, projects. It hides the rope from me, the ignorance, and projects the rope as a snake. Yeah. Ignorance about Brahman hides the nature of Brahman from me, that I am Brahman. All of this is I, the Brahman. The entire world is superimposed, is an appearance on the, on the Adhishthana, that the ground of appearance, that is Brahman, which is I myself. This is hidden. And it's hidden, and then it's projected. The same Brahman is projected as world. People, 
animals and birds and things going on outside, actions, body, mind, breath, all of these are superimpositions projected by the vikshepa shakti, the projecting power of ignorance. Now he says, once the veil of ignorance is removed, then error is uh, removed, Brahma, doubt is gone forever. Error, I am the body and mind. Body and mind are still appearing, but now there is no more error. I am the one consciousness in which body and mind is experienced. This is a separate world from me. No, I am the one unbroken reality in which it appears in the form of separate beings. Avibhaktam cha bhuteshu, undivided in all beings. Vibhaktam ivachastitam, appears to be as if divided in separate beings. This becomes very clear. So this is enlightenment. God realization, Brahmagyana, whatever you call it, uh, Aparokshanubhuti, the direct immediate realization of one's own nature. But this is not the end. It is the beginning. Swami Brahmananda used to say, uh, after Brahmagyana, after Nirvikalpa Samadhi, spiritual life begins. Now, what an amazing statement that is. <laughs> and he will see that now. Enlightenment has been achieved. What remains? What is there after enlightenment? There is something to, uh, to be experienced and that will, that is called Jivan Mukti. Jivan Mukti beings, being enlightened in this very life, still living in this body and mind, life continues as usual. What happens then? What is the remarkable, the, the fantastic, unparalleled change that happens in our lives? So that's what he will talk about in the next few verses. What is Jivan Mukti? So the goal of Advaita Vedanta is not only moksha, liberation. That is the goal of all the other philosophies also in India. Whether it's Buddhism, Jainism, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, uh, Yoga, all of them have moksha as their goal, liberation. But Advaita is, it has a peculiar, has a, has a speciality, uniqueness. That moksha not only after death, but here and now, while living in this body, you are completely liberated, you're absolutely free, you realize yourself as Brahman. What's that like? How is that to be achieved? What is there anything that remains to be done to enjoy that? And that becomes the goal. Jivan Mukti becomes the goal, and not just moksha. So they make a division between Jivan Mukti and Videya Mukti. Videya Mukti means final liberation after the death of the body. That's there. And that's common with every other philosophy, every other religion, in fact. That's the ultimate goal. But Advaita Vedanta says here and now, right now, full and complete liberation. How is that possible from today onwards? So that will be discussed. There's a deep, fascinating discussion, but that's advanced Advaita Vedanta. Let's, let's put it that way. That's for next time, next Sunday. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu.